We're continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark this morning. Uh, it's good to be back with you guys. Really missed being here last week, but uh, uh, and um, I, I, I noticed that uh, uh, Tyler only preached for about twenty minutes, so y'all know not to get used to that, I guess. But uh, but anyway, uh, we do our best. <laughs> uh, I promise. I try to make them short every week. I'm like, I'm going to make it shorter this week. But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> we're in uh, going through the gospel of mark in, in this series serving like jesus and today we're in, uh, uh, in the middle of chapter nine and a message that we called escaping the sin of pridefulness and so if you'll turn to mark chapter nine we're going to start reading at verse 30 if you remember <laughs> last time we met we uh, uh, saw uh, unfaithfulness, and we, we uh, talked about the sin of unfaithfulness. Today we're going to see Jesus address the sin of pridefulness and uh, <clears throat> take three chunks out of the middle of this chapter. So let's read it together. Beginning at verse 30, God's word says, Then they departed from there. That there is uh, Caesarea Philippi, that area where uh, this last work was going on, and, and they passed through the Galilee, the northern part of the Galilee, and he says he did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What is it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me, for he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we do just bow before you again this morning. God, we're thankful for this word. Uh, Lord, um, we pray today that you would address our hearts, convict us of our sin, and Lord, make us right with you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis is a cowboy from Oklahoma. He was born in 1957. And uh, he fought out of Chicago in the early 80s. Some of you older folks might remember him. <laughs> he said, he does a story. I think I may have shared this with you guys before. But he, he, he remembers his first day in the Windy City after his arrival from Tulsa. He uh, said, I got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under my arms in downtown Chicago. He said, I stopped in front of the Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down, and I looked up at that tower, and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. And he said, when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. <laughs> what a way to start, right? And I want to I'll share that illustration with you this morning because, in a sense, that's, that's what pride will do to you. We're talking about the sin of pridefulness this morning. We see it in these three different stories that, that as Jesus interacted with his disciples in our text today. But you know, when, when you're swelled with pride, one moment you think you have the world by the throat and you smell sweet victory and 
it can be one second later you realize your world has beaten you down to within an inch of your own life. That's what pride will do to you. In our text today, Jesus addressed the sin of pridefulness. And you know that that that's one of those one of those sins that affects all of us in to, in some degree. And you know, I, I've even brought it up in discussing passages and sin, all other sins almost seem to be linked to pride, to, to self-fulfillment, when you think about it. Every other sin you commit is about you putting you first. And so pridefulness is, is not something to dismiss, I guess, dismiss at all. But Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So that's the warning about pride. So how do you have victory over a prideful spirit? How, how can you have victory over that? How do, you, how do you have victory over pridefulness that ultimately will destroy us? Well, Tony Merida, a pastor in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a pre preaching professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, he said this, he said, the gospel frees us from our addiction to ourselves. And I, and I, I believe that's right. Because when you give your heart and life to Jesus with faith in him in a response to the gospel, you are freed from your need for pridefulness. Because you, you, when, when you're saved, you admit that I'm nothing, I'm a sinner, and Jesus is everything. And, and when, when the Holy Spirit indwells you, you no longer need to be swelled with pride. Because <laughs> anything that, that's good in us comes from him, right? So, but one, one of the problems is that even though that your heart might be right with Jesus, even though you might be a child of God, your flesh, which is not redeemed, which is still fallen, still cries out for you to put yourself first, doesn't it? And that's one of the struggles we have. And, and, and so you, you, you want to defeat pridefulness. And if you really want to defeat pridefulness, you, you must first come to Jesus in faith. You've got to be one of his because that's the only way we can, we can defeat pridefulness. And then you've got to live and love like Jesus. You've got to give yourself to living like him, loving people like him, and serving other people like him. And, uh, you know, Jesus ultimately gave us that uh, uh, I guess the ultimate lesson in defeating pridefulness and humility and, and service, didn't he? And this whole book, this gospel is about Jesus, uh, the servant that we want to follow. And so today I want to reveal three admissions today that you should make to help you escape the danger of pridefulness, okay? Three things that you should admit Okay? Uh, sometimes it's hard for us to admit stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I never will forget Happy Days. Some of y'all remember that show, and, and the Fonz couldn't ever say he was wrong. I was, you know, he just, he just couldn't do it. Sometimes we just have to admit stuff, right? And so the first thing that you need to admit if, if you want to escape the sin of pridefulness is you need to admit that I don't always have to understand. I don't always have to understand. Now, we want to understand, and it's good to understand. And I don't want to give you an excuse for being lazy and not working hard to understand biblical truths. But I do want you to understand that you don't have to understand everything about everything that God is doing to keep following Jesus. You follow me? <laughs> You know, a lot of times people say, oh, I don't get it, so I just give up, or I quit. No, you don't. We're not going to understand everything that God's doing. We're just not. Not on this side of heaven. Not on this side of our glorified bodies. God's doing a lot of stuff that we're never going to understand in, in, these, in this sinful flesh. And so we have to understand that. But notice the disciples, that here's something that they didn't understand about the plan of God, but they kept following Jesus. They, they struggled, just like us. And uh, I'm thankful that we have that example of them up and down, just like we are a lot of times. But, but notice in verse 30, it says, as they departed from that area 
of Caesarea Philippi where they had just learned the lesson on faith. They headed south and they were passing through Galilee. Now this would be Jesus' final trip through Galilee. This would be his final visit in this area where he grew up, where he pretty much knew everybody, and where he spent the majority of time in his ministry. This is last time in Galilee. His focus now is on Jerusalem. It's going to be on the cross, and he's moving toward that time and in his final days where he's going to die on the cross for our sins. And so that's what's happening. And, and you know, <laughs> interestingly, Mark, Mark wrote, he didn't want anyone to know it. Uh, you know, he, he didn't want anyone to know his movement. So the first word, words of verse 31 may tell us why he wanted to move through the area stealthily. It says uh, he, he taught his disciples. So he's, maybe he's, they're staying away from the cities. You know, they're, they're, they're traveling through the countryside because Jesus wants to teach his disciples. He wants them to understand his mission. And he's trying to prepare them for what's going to take place. And he's been doing this, and we've seen this a few times. And he, he spelled it out exactly as it would happen here in verse 31. He says, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he's killed, he'll rise the third day. So the Son of Man, I, I've shared this with you guys before, but it's a, a, way, a, a popular way that Jesus used to refer to himself. It's from... A uh, prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 that talks about the Ancient of Days and how the Son of Man will come and he'll reign for, you know, he's from the Ancient of Days and he'll reign forever. And it's about the Messiah. And the disciples, they like that kind of stuff. They like that passage. And, and, uh, but, but notice Jesus said that he would be betrayed. The word betrayed, is the, the literal translation of that word means to, to hand over, or to be handed over is how it's, how it's structured, to be handed over. And so obviously we know, knowing the story, we know that Judas, one of his disciples, ultimately handed him over to the authorities. And so that's where we get the word betrayal. And um, we know that Jesus would be crucified, but, but God's plan ultimately was for this to take place, wasn't it? God knew this was going to take place. You, you can't always say God exactly made it happen. Somehow God works through people and even their sins and brings things to pass. That he has planned. And so, but God's plan was that through the death of Jesus, the sin of the world could be atoned for and the wrath of God would be appeased for our sin. So ultimately, we don't have to die for our own sin. That's what's going on. And Jesus is trying to help them. And he, he also told them he's going to die, but he said, I'm going to rise again on the third day. And so I know you guys understand, but I just want to make it clear, just like Jesus, I guess, is trying to make it clear to his disciples that your salvation and mine ultimately rest in the vicarious suffering and death and resurrection of the Son of Man. That's Jesus. He died in your place, in my place, and he rose again so that we can be saved from our sins. Verse 32 says... They didn't understand what he was saying. And they were afraid to ask him. Hmm. I've been there, you know. And, and, and I've seen it with my boys. I'm talking to them and I'm telling them something. And, and yet they're like this. And then finally I say, okay, what did I just say? And they're like, well, no, you didn't get it, did you? No? Okay. Uh, you know, but, but the disciples didn't understand now, how many times has Jesus tried to tell them that he's going to suffer and die and rise again? Uh, you know, he, he, he's going to tell them again. And they still won't get it, and it won't all come together until all of these events have taken place, and they're on the other side of the cross and the resurrection, and finally they're going to say, oh, yeah, I remember him saying that this was going to happen. Finally, it's going to all come together. You see, because their understanding of who the Messiah would be kept them from seeing the Son of Man as a suffering servant. They didn't have any room in their worldview for a crucified Christ. That's why they didn't understand. Because they couldn't believe that God would crucify the Messiah. They didn't see that in Scripture. And so when Jesus kept saying that, they were like, you know, 
Give them one of them looks. I don't get it, Big Dad. You know? Some of y'all may know that reference. But, but, but they just didn't understand. And not only did they not understand, but they were afraid to ask for an explanation. I want to tell you, don't ever be afraid to just ask Jesus <laughs> and admit to Jesus that, you know, I just don't understand. Help me understand, Lord, and, and uh, you know, make it a matter of prayer. But, but I want you to grasp this truth this morning. I want you also to understand that you do not have to completely understand all that God is doing to keep on following him and to keep on trusting him and to keep on serving him. <laughs> Some people, you know, it's called faith when you just trust God and you do things that almost sound crazy sometimes and, 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 and that don't make sense. It, and that's what God does sometimes. And you don't have to understand in that moment what God is doing to trust him. General Douglas MacArthur was talking about studying the time-space relationship that Einstein's theory uh, was developed, you know, this theory of relativity. And he was studying that while he was a student at West Point. And he said, the text was really complex, and, and I, I was unable to really understand it. And so he said, I committed the pages in the text to memory. So he, you know, he just memorized it. And he said, when I was called upon in class to recite or explain it, he said, I just reeled off almost word for word what the book said. <laughs> he said his instructor, Colonel Feiberger, Fy looked at him somewhat quizzically and said, MacArthur, do you understand this theory? <laughs> Mark MacArthur said, hey, it was a bad moment for me, but I didn't hesitate in replying. He said, no, sir. <laughs> he said, you could have heard a pin drop. He said, I braced myself and I waited, and the professor just looked at him and said, neither do I, MacArthur. Section dismissed. <laughs> Oh man, sometimes you just don't understand. You know, you just you just trust. You just trust. And when you when you fail to follow God's will for your life because you don't understand, then you allow the sin of pridefulness to take root and and it keeps you from God's blessings. And God's will is perfect. And we can trust him. Romans 12:2 uh, says that uh, it's the perfect and acceptable will of God. And sometimes God leads us to do things that don't make sense. And, and sometimes the events in our lives seem to disrupt the way that, the, 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 uh, that we think things ought to be. <laughs> you know, and, and we're like, what's up, God? What, what's going on? Why is this happening? Or, you know, it doesn't seem like this would be best. And, and, and even when you don't completely understand it, I want to encourage you, just trust him. And keep on following him. Even when you don't. I mean, you can escape the sin of pridefulness. If you admit. I don't always have to understand. What God is doing. Another admission that you can. Uh, that can help you escape the sin of pridefulness is this. I don't always. Have to be first. Say that one with me. <laughs> I don't always have to be first, right? And uh, you know, most of the time we don't we don't think we have a problem with this, and that may be the problem <laughs> that we don't recognize that we have this problem. But 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 as we move on, we see in the text that that Jesus arrived at Capernaum, where he's he often stayed in the home of Peter's mother-in-law. There uh, and uh, by the way, if you visit Israel, they've excavated this place. And you can see walls, and, and they've got it covered. You can actually go in there protecting, and you can go in and you can see where they believe this house was, where Jesus spent most of his time in Capernaum. It's pretty neat. So, so uh, if you want to go, let me know. I'll go with you. But anyway, uh, but they, 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 here he's in Capernaum, and he's probably in this house because that's where he spent most of his time. And <clears throat> he, he asked the disciples what they were arguing about as they traveled. You see that? He said, what was it that you disputed about among yourselves on the road? See that? Uh, 
Uh, you know, it happens. You hear parts of conversation. Of course, Jesus knew everything, right? But, but, but you know, it happens. You know, uh, uh, especially in, in our house, a lot of times. I'm like, what, what was y'all talking about in here? What was y'all arguing about? You know, sometimes it's that. But, but you know, that's what Jesus said. Well, what was y'all arguing about when we traveled? And they probably thought they'd gotten away with it, and Jesus hadn't noticed. But now it's out in the open, right? <laughs> and oh, he does know. He did hear. He he know. It says in verse thirty-four that they kept silent. Because they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. He said they wouldn't, they stayed silent, they wouldn't answer. And sometimes, you know, that's the best thing to do, just, just be silent. You know, usually when they ask the question, they already know anyway. But um, they were arguing about who was the greatest, they were filled with a sin of pridefulness. Some of the texts talk about how they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in his kingdom. See, they, they, they didn't understand the first part about what Jesus' death and, and resurrection, so they didn't understand the kingdom. <laughs> they didn't understand what they were even asking. But they were arguing about who was going to be Jesus' right-hand man when he reigns. Hmm. People haven't changed much in the last 2,000 years, have they? <laughs> folks still value rank and importance and recognition the same way they did back then. And it's still rooted in the sin of pridefulness, just like it always has been. Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Hmm. Verse 35, as we move on in our text, Jesus so the text says Jesus sat down. See that? Don't just, don't just, you know, Mark notes that, but that's not something you just brush over because if you understand culture and teaching, then Jesus is the rabbi, right? He's the teacher. And this is the traditional position a rabbi took when students taught. It would be just like when I come up here and stand behind this. Everybody gets quiet because they know, hey, he's getting ready to teach, right? He's getting ready to preach. But when Jesus sat down, that's what they understood. He's getting ready to teach us something. And, and by the way, <clears throat> when he sat down, the students stood up. They stood while the teacher sat. I think we ought to try that one Sunday. You know, it, it, it's supposed to help keep your attention. You know, if I'm teaching, I don't need my t attention. I, I'm good, you know, so I can sit down and stay alert. And, and so it's harder to fall asleep when you're standing up, right? And so uh, although I know I can't stop some of you, I've seen it. But, but anyway, uh, but by, by sitting, Jesus took the position that, hey, I'm, I'm about to teach you something, something important. And so he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. The lesson on being a servant, he, he's saying, you know, he's saying if you want to be first, you got to be last. If you want to be great, you got to be the least, right? The lesson on being a servant, it doesn't denigrate greatness. It doesn't devalue being great. Greatness should be desired. We should Strive for greatness in that sense. Be the best at everything we can, uh, you know, that, that we do and that kind of thing. We ought to. Uh, but, 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 and so greatness should be desired, but great, the greatness you seek may need to be redefined because we don't understand greatness like Jesus defined greatness. You know, Plato said, how can a man be happy when he has to serve someone? That's what Plato said. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says you'll only find real and lasting joy when you do serve someone. Not because you have to, but because you get to and because you want to. Jesus says being a servant makes you greater. That's what Jesus said. Now who are you going with? <laughs> and Jesus then he gives them a little a physical example. He took a little child and he set the child in the middle of them. And so uh, probably one of Peter's 
kids or grandkids or whatever. You know, he's at Peter's mother-in-law's house most likely, but children around. And, and he took the little child in his arms and he says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not just me, but him who sent me. And so you got to understand, in Jesus' day, the status of children wasn't elevated like it was today. When little children running around in a the, in the church building like they do here, that wouldn't happen back in that day, you know. Everybody said, oh, how cute, and all of that. No, they didn't do that stuff. I mean, they, I mean, they loved children. People loved children, and they, they tried to take care of children, but, but children were considered the least. And when they gathered for meals, guess who ate last and whatever was left? The children, right? I mean, that probably still happened. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember, you know, you didn't get your plate before the adults got their plates. So that's not been too long ago. But, but anyway, but, but, but this is the society they lived in you know, that children were really considered, because of, of um, what do you call it, um, because a lot of, lot of little children died, you know, before they reached certain ages and that kind of thing, I can't think of the exact terminology I'm looking for, a lot of people, they just devalued children, especially the littler children, and, and, and so they were grouped with kind of like lepers and maimed and, and those considered burdens to society, because Children are to be served, but cannot serve you. You see what I'm saying? They cannot reciprocate your service. Now, we all understand that, don't we? <laughs> and so that's kind of what he's getting at here, I think, is Jesus was saying to accept those who have no standing in society and treat them well and serve them. Serve those people like you serve children who can never in any way repay you back, right? They can't repay you. That, he says, that's the way to greatness. This is the lesson Jesus is trying to give them. He said, die to self, serve others, care for those no one else cares for, receive them in my name and you receive me. And, and you receive me, you receive the Father, the one who sent me. The way up is down. The way to get is to give. The way to be first is to be last. That's the way of Jesus. You have to admit, I don't always have to be first. And as a matter of fact, I should try to be last. Abraham Lincoln once got caught up in a situation where he wanted to please a politician, so he gave a command to transfer certain regiments. And when the secretary, his secretary of war, Edward, uh, Edwin Stanton, got the order, he refused to carry it out. He he, he said, President Lincoln's a fool. <laughs> Lincoln was told what Stanton said, and he said, well, if Stanton said I'm a fool, then I must be, because he's nearly always right. He says, I'll see for myself. And so he went and talked to his secretary of war, and the president quickly realized his decision was a serious mistake, and without hesitation, he withdrew it. He admitted, I don't always have to be first. Sometimes somebody else has got the right answer besides me. He didn't insist on his way. He humbled himself and he accepted the facts that were presented to him by somebody who had more knowledge on the subject. He didn't always have to be first. That's the way to true greatness. That's what Jesus says. If you want to escape the sin of pridefulness, you must admit you don't always have to understand and you must admit you don't always have to be first. Another thing you need to admit is this. If you want to escape the sin of pridefulness, you need to admit I don't always have to participate. I don't always have to participate. And I hope you can get this point. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> When we read on, you notice in verse 38, it's like three different sections quickly changing different ideas here, but they kind of flow in a sense of, of, with this idea of pridefulness, uh, and that's why I'm tying them together. But, but apparently, you know, John wanted to change the subject. You know, he, you know, he wanted to get away from this embarrassing dispute about who was the greatest, and he wanted to leave that behind him. So he brought up some recently discovered suspicious activity. He says, 
Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. So they saw somebody who wasn't a part of their group casting out demons in Jesus' name. So John said, hey, I put a stop to it because he's not one of us. He's not following us. Notice the separation and the division and everything that John said. He, you know, he does not follow us. He says it twice. He's not a part of us. You notice us, us, us. You hear that? Us, us, us. He's not us. It's not us. He's not part of the in group. How many of y'all have ever felt like you were not a part of the in group? Yeah. We've all been there, haven't we? And that, uh, that group that you thought that you wanted to be a part of, they looked over at you and they thought, they probably thought, I'm not a part of that group, you know? <laughs> it's all mindset most of the time, I think. But he, he, it seems that John, he may have just been looking for approval. He's like, hey, you know, we might have been arguing about who was the greatest, but look what I did. I put a stop to this, you know? <laughs> but that's not what he got, was no, no approval from Jesus. She said, notice Jesus' response. So his first Four words. Do not forbid him. Do not forbid him. You see, John, John's thinking, hey, this group over here, they're doing some stuff, and they, they're acting like they're a part of us, but they're not a part of us. Guess what? To be a part of what God's doing, you don't have to be a participant. God can work through other people and other groups, too. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's the lesson here, I think, that that, uh, that Jesus is trying to help them understand. He, he says, don't, don't forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak of me. So first, he, he, Jesus gave him two reasons not to forbid him. The first one is he, uh, he affirmed the work of others outside the group. He says, uh, no one works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. So Jesus is saying, hey, if they're doing this in my name, and they're doing it in my power, you know, in my name, then, then they're not against me. Don't stop them. And so, uh, and, the, and the second reason, he says, for he who's not against us is on our side. He's for us. And so if he's not against us, he's for us. The point was that even though they're not in the same group, they're still working for us. They're still working with us even though they're separate. And, and, you know, Paul expressed this same sentiment in his letter to the churches at Philippi. I want you to read this passage with me in Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes in, in beginning at verse 15, he says, Some indeed preach Christ. Now pay attention to this. He says, Some indeed preach Christ for, even from envy and strife. Okay. Some, some are preaching out of envy and, and, and strife. And, and, but he says, And some are preaching from goodwill. And he says, the former preach Christ from selfish ambition. Not sincerely. They're not even preaching Christ sincerely. They're just being selfish. They're prideful. <laughs> Supposing to add afflictions to my chains. But he says, but the latter out of love. So some are preaching out of love. They're, they're doing it right. Knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Notice what he says in verse 18. He says, what then? Only that in every way, look at this, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. See that? And he says, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. <laughs> so Paul's saying, hey, even if they're pretending to be preachers and they're not even true followers, if they're preaching Christ and they're preaching the gospel, rejoice that Christ is being preached. You see that? And so... <sighs> Finally, in, in verse 41, Jesus says, For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So this final condition is if you show allegiance to Christ by serving others in the name of the Christ, then you're not going to uh, lose your reward. And so Jesus is saying he sees those acts of service, and he's going to reward the smallest and humblest acts of service Done in his name. To whomever they're done to. And, and so having, having a love and concern for others reflects the love and concern that Jesus has for all people. Especially those who are outcasts and overlooked and in need. See the point. 
The point is that whoever is serving others in the name of Christ shouldn't be prevented. That's what Jesus is saying. You, you, you don't have to be a part of every work that God is doing everywhere. Do you get that? God's done a lot of stuff through a lot of other people in other denominations and in other churches and in other works. And so, you know, a lot of times you get this. Oh, well, that church down there, they, they don't preach from the KJV or they got weird music or they, they do this or they don't do that or all these different things. And listen, don't, 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 nobody needs to run down another church that's preaching the gospel, that's trying to love people and try to build the kingdom of God. We ought to be praying for one another and helping one another. That's what Jesus said. I don't have to participate in every church for God to work in that church, and neither do you. <laughs> I think that's a lesson we need to learn. We ought to cooperate more and pray for one another more and help one another more than we do. Sometimes, you know, we were tempted to disrupt and disapprove verbally and openly and maybe social media. <laughs> you know, but we need to be careful doing those kind of things because we can hinder the work of God. God can use those people. He can use those groups. And he's working through all of us ultimately together to accomplish his purpose. I don't have to participate. I don't have to always be a participant. That's what I mean. In everything that God's doing. He's doing a lot of stuff, a lot of places that I, I don't even know about. Jimmy Durant was a great entertainer back in the early part of the 20th century. And he was asked to be a part of a show for World War II veterans. And he told them his, his schedule was very busy and he could only afford a few minutes. But if they wouldn't mind him doing just one short monologue and immediately leaving for his next appointment, he said he, said he would come. And so they said, of course, you know, and they agreed and he came. And, and when Jimmy got on stage, something interesting happened. He went through his little short monologue and he stayed. And the applause grew louder and louder and he kept staying and... Pretty soon he had been on 15, 20, and even more than 30 minutes. And finally he took a last, last bow and he left the stage. And, and when he came backstage, someone stopped him and said, I thought you had to go after a few minutes. What happened? You've been out there for 30 something minutes. And he said, well, I did have to go, but I can show you the reason I stayed. He said, you can see for yourself, if you look down on the front row, and in the front row were two men, veterans, each of whom had lost an arm in the war. One of them had lost the right arm and the other one had lost the left. And together they stood clapping <laughs> loudly and cheerfully. And that's what urged him to, to keep performing. See, those, those two weren't even a part of the same body, but they worked together. To bring applause for the one who brought them joy. I want you to understand folks. We don't have to be a part of the same group. To see that we're working together. To applaud the one who ultimately brings us joy. The Lord Jesus. We ought to give him some applause together. Amen. It's an act of pridefulness when we believe that we're the only church or the only pastor, the only person that God can use to serve other people in the name of Christ. So to escape the sin of pridefulness, you may need to admit, I don't always need to participate. <laughs> you know, God often works through others without my help. And that's true. So today, I want you to understand that pride sometimes will creep in, even in the life of a believer. And, and it'll bring division, and it'll bring hurt, and it will disrupt the work of God when we think we have to understand everything God, God's doing through everyone else, and we have to approve what God's doing through everyone else, and we think we have to be the first, 
And nobody else can do it like we can. And, and we have all those kind of mindsets. We feel like we're the only group or the only one that God can work through. Then we've got a problem. That's not the spirit of Christ. And I want you to understand faith in, in Jesus and God's work and his plan to redeem souls and lives in the cities and, and nations around you. It can free you from the addiction that you have to yourself. And you're right with Jesus. And so this morning, I just want to ask you, will you come to Jesus in faith? Will you remove your pride? Will you let him remove your pride and save your soul from hell? You know, maybe you're already a Christian, but your method of trying to be great has been all about you. Will you recognize the way to becoming or the way to greatness is by becoming less, by becoming a servant. It's, it's about giving yourself away. Will you give yourself away in the name of Jesus? Let's respond in faith this morning as we sing, and um, let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word today. God, we pray that as we offer this time of response that every heart and soul and every person, Lord, will just examine ourselves, Lord, and that we confess the sin of problems. Lord, we know ultimately we need to be redeemed and delivered by you, by grace, through faith alone. And God, we pray if there's one here today that needs that, God, we pray that right now that you'd save them, God, and help them. And Lord, um, the there's others here today, Lord, who just need to repent. And Lord, to make their life a little bit more about you than, the, than, than about me. God will help us to do that. In Jesus' name, right now, have your way in every heart. Amen. So let's stand together.